When James asked me to do a keynote, I really struggled with the topic. After all, I've done a half dozen of these for summits over the years. And so you really do have to fight to think of something original, something people will care about, and something that'll maybe do some good. So I decided to maybe ask around. I posted on Twitter and LinkedIn asking folks for ideas. That got a little weird in places. Y'all are, are weird, some of you. But I did get some good ideas. A history of PowerShell. How are my career changes going? Something motivational about community. Ah, but, but which one to choose? I decided to do them all. And rather than thinking too hard about it, I decided I'd kind of just build a presentation as a stream of consciousness and see how it turned out. Realizing that approach could be a bad idea, I decided to throw in a really awesome hook for the end. Don't you dare fast forward, though, because then you'll miss all the jokes. So, with that in mind, I hope you like it. Here it is. My keynote for PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit 2021, a small collection of imperfect thoughts. Now, do realize that if we take the release date for PowerShell 1.0 back in November 2006 at TechEd Europe in Barcelona as its birth date, then the shell today would be a rude, foul-mouthed, pimply-faced teenager in the throes of puberty. Fortunately, I think the shell has aged a lot better than that, or at least a lot faster. Actually, I think it's aged great. I mean, this is what I used to look like. And even this photo is from a few years after I wrote this, which was the first book ever published on Windows PowerShell. This was my MVP profile photo for a long time. God, I was young. You people have aged me. But PowerShell's birth was actually a few years even earlier. And, as with many births, it all started with a lie. Back in the early 2000s, Intel, yeah, Intel, had a problem. For years, they'd been designing their famous x86 architecture CPUs on Sun Spark stations. Computers that ran Unix and didn't even run on Intel processors. It was, it was a little embarrassing. So Intel went to Microsoft and said, look, we want to switch over to using our own chips to design our chips, but we need some operating system support. Like for example, Windows just sucks for automation, and we've got all of these corn shell Unix scripts that we use. Can you, can you help us make Windows not suck so much? Sure, Bill Gates says. I'll get a team right on it. Now, this is one of my favorite stories, and it's documented in my book, Shell of an Idea, The Untold History of PowerShell. Microsoft put together a team, and they were going to produce Kermit, not the frog, basically just a port of corn shell to Windows so that Intel could safely switch to Windows for chip design, which was the lie, of course. Intel was already building their own Linux distribution, and the whole thing with Windows was more of a plan B, or even a plan F. But what's important for us is that Microsoft put a team on it. A team means money. People and money are how you get things made. That's where this dude came in. Jeffrey Snover had already been doing some work to make Windows suck less when it came to automation. He'd led teams that developed a few dozen new command line tools, and he'd raised the bar with a WMIC, a command line shell of sorts, for working with Windows management instrumentation. He caught wind of what the Kermit team was doing and convinced them to head in a different direction. Monad, a new all-encompassing automation shell for Windows. The rest, of course, is history. But there's a lesson here I don't want you to lose track of. PowerShell exists because there was an opportunity and someone with vision. Vision is a big part of how you make things happen, but the other part is being able to communicate that vision. Sharing the vision with other people in a way they can understand and relate to and showing them how they fit into that vision and exactly how they can make it reality. That's really what leadership is if you boil it down to its essence. And while not all of us are going to invent a new shell or the concept of ride sharing or a new type of rocket, all of us can actually be leaders. Leadership starts by seeing a problem 
and being able to clearly articulate that problem. You need to be able to describe the impacts the problem has, like how much time or money are wasted because of the problem. And you need to get really specific about that. This is where I think a lot of us go wrong. For a lot of us, our statement of the problem is just something like, my job is repetitive and error prone, and something like PowerShell would be a solution. Except that problem statement might not resonate with anyone but ourselves. See, when you're communicating a problem, you can't communicate it as you see the problem. You need to get inside the heads of your audience. What do they see as the problem? How can you communicate the problem in a way that they will see it as a problem? How can you make it relatable? That's really the key to getting stuff done in the world. Once you've got the problem firmly in people's minds, you can pitch the solution. You have to do this carefully too. Your pitch needs to clearly line up to the problem. Your audience not only needs to see the problem and believe in it, they also need to see how your solution 100% aligns to that problem and solves it. Let me offer an example. This is the first part of the table of contents for Windows PowerShell TFM, the first book Jeff Hicks and I wrote when we worked at Sapien Technologies in 2007. We began with a bunch of random stuff about PowerShell like Providers and snap-ins and variables and functions, and then it was right on to writing your first script. Yeah, seriously, why did anyone ever like this book? Look, part of the reason we wrote it this way, to be fair, is because our initial audience was all VB script people. So we wrote a PowerShell book for VB script people. Looking back at this table of contents, though, I, I still cringe. But we we stuck in there. We created a bigger second edition, and then a version 2.0 edition when V2 shipped. But then he and I stepped away from Sapien and honestly kind of decided not to write any more PowerShell books. Three was enough. But then something funny started to happen. People kept asking for a good PowerShell book. The TFMs were getting a little old by then. And so I looked around and all the books I've, there were books on tossing people into programming right away, basically. But the people asking me for recommendations didn't want to become programmers. You see, they basically got the problem of automation being a pain in Windows, but they didn't see programming as their solution. They didn't want to be programmers. They'd stayed away from VB script because it was programming. Everyone, even me, was pitching PowerShell as a programming language. And it just wasn't a compelling solution to the audience. See, you can lead people to a solution they don't want. Or that they don't feel is a solution for them. But it's not going to do them any good. You can show it to them, but it's not going to help. So I sat down and thought about it. And that's where this puppy came from. The idea was to listen closely to the audience and craft a solution that fit them. They didn't want to invest years, and so I promised that in an hour a day for about a month was enough. I researched how much the average adult can read in 45 minutes and set that as my chapter length. I made sure each chapter had some hands-on exercises to cement what you learned, and I didn't bring up scripting, that is, programming, at all. Leadership of any kind is all about understanding who you're trying to lead. It's about helping them see their place in the vision and where they are on the road to creating that vision. It's what Jeffrey did with the Kermit team when he hijacked them to make Monad. And it's something you can do all the time in both your personal and professional lives. You know, this brings up another interesting point. I know a lot of folks who want to contribute to the community to to help out in some way. But they look around And it seems like everyone is already doing all the things. There's no real place for them to help out. But that's not the right way to look at things. You see, we have a lot of different audiences in the world. They speak different languages. They come from different cultures. They have different past experiences. And those experiences kind of shape how they learn new things. They have different pressures they're under at work and different things they're trying to accomplish. They're all different audiences, in other words, and each audience needs its own special solutions that are made just for them. 
That's why there's room for everyone to contribute. The way you phrase something, the projects you're tackling, the examples you use, the language you speak, it's a unique and valuable combination. You don't have to bring new information into the world to be valuable. Instead, you just need to package the information that's already there for whatever audience you serve. When I wrote the first month of Lunch's book, I wasn't carving out some brave new territory and releasing new information into the world. I was just packaging the information that was already in the world so that it served a particular audience. It was a a different audience than I had addressed with prior books, which is why it's okay to have many books on the same topic. It all matters because it's serving an audience. Now, I want to shift gears a bit because it occurs to me that I haven't talked about the damn virus yet. This is actually related, I swear. Back when Richard and Jason and Jeff and Kirk and I started PowerShell.org, we didn't set up a corporation or anything for it. We just, we just kind of set it up. This was back in 2012, I think. But very quickly, we realized that we needed to run a conference because the people who ran the PowerShell team at Microsoft told us to. And so we set up PowerShell.org as a not-for-profit corporation. Now look, not-for-profit is a statement of intent, not an actual corporate structure. We were allowed to make a profit, but we didn't really want to. But the government likes taxes, and so we'd have to pay taxes on any extra money we made. It made the first few summits a little tricky. We had to set up a fiscal year that started in November, start ticket sales after that, and then hold the summit and spend all the money before November rolled around again and we had to pay taxes. It made it difficult to build something permanent because we kept having to start over every year. That's why I eventually sat down and formed the DevOps Collective. It's a bona fide legal nonprofit, which means it can accumulate money and not pay taxes. That was the start of something sustainable because we can make a little more than we needed each year and then use that to kick off the next year. It also meant that eventually we could have one or two full-time employees actually running the program. And look, it's great to rely on volunteers, but having just a couple people who can do the work and support their families at the same time is how you ensure the organization doesn't die just because someone lost interest. Now, you may wonder what this has to do with COVID, and I'll tell you. The organization makes all of its money from Summit. In 2020, the year that needed to just go die in a fire, didn't allow us to have a summit. And I'll be honest, it's been a rough ride. James Petty, the organization's CEO, has been okay, but it won't hold out forever. Without some money in the bank, there's no website. There's no more free ebooks. There's no helping to bootstrap local PowerShell Saturday events. There's no more summit. So I want to ask you to do two important things. One, If you can contribute some money to the org, please do. It's tax deductible. The DevOps Collective is registered with Amazon Smile. And frankly, given how much I know you all spend on Amazon, the org could probably support itself if everyone who visited PowerShell.org just remembered to use smile.amazon.com for every purchase and to designate the collective as their charity. If this organization and the people in it have helped you, have meant anything to you, please Contribute what you can. Two, I need you to participate in the community. Not just take from it, but give back to it. Commit to writing a single monthly blog post about something you solved at work or even on an aha moment you had. Not a writer? Fine. Get in touch with James and tell him you want to do a monthly um, coding session on Twitch to show people in a very informal way how you approached a problem. Help Jeff Hicks make Iron Scripter a global phenomenon by offering to write puzzles and by helping promote it. Get in the forums on PowerShell.org and answer questions. Offer to update some of the open source free ebooks I wrote for the org. Do anything you can. The more content on PowerShell.org, the more people who show up. And the more who show up, the more who will attend Summit, both virtual and in person. And that's how they fund the org. If all of this means anything positive to you, please help out. The problem, we want more folks contributing to the community. The solution, 
I don't know. What would the solution be for you? Can you show other people how they can contribute? Can you, can you create ideas and opportunities? Because that's leadership and it's what raises the tide for all of us. Friends, we are stronger together. But you may not realize how few people really carry the burden on a daily basis. If this community, if the people in it, if they're valuable to you, then come up with ways to help carry the load. Don't just ask how you can help. Look, you're all, you're all systems engineers of some kind, right? Look at the problem yourself and pitch a solution. You'll end up pitching something more useful and more powerful than I can suggest. Get involved. Show other people how to get involved. Don't be on the outside of the community. Wade in and get your hands dirty. I'll leave you with a couple of final thoughts. Many of you have, uh, many of you have read Be the Master, a short of uh, motivational and career success book that I wrote through four editions. It's discontinued now because much of it's been reframed into this book from Manning, Own Your Tech Career. And yeah, this is the third title we're trying, and as I record this keynote, it's going through its final production stages. Leading up to this keynote, a lot of folks asked how my own career is going, and I think it relates strongly to a key message from the book and one that I, I hope will resonate with you. That message is this. Own your career. Back in 2018, I decided it was time to move out of the front lines of technology and to step away from the day-to-day -day details of PowerShell, a technology I've been with for more than 14 years now. And that decision was just that a decision. I sat down and I looked at the kind of life I wanted to live and the things I wanted to have in that life. Money was part of that, of course, but I also wanted an opportunity to build teams and help other people grow their careers. I, I wanted to help a company, I wanted to help run a company whose mission I believed in and where I, someone who was independent for 13 years, could feel like a part of something bigger. Then I decided what kind of career would get me those things that I wanted. And then I went out and made that career happen. This is me all those years ago. In 2006, when PowerShell came out, I was still teaching VBScript classes, writing VBScript books, and making VBScript videos. In fact, um, I had my 35th birthday just a week after PowerShell was released to the world. This is me now. I'll turn 50 later this year. 2020 was pretty awful. I lost the little amount of muscle I'd spent the last nine years managing to put on. My triglycerides more than doubled. And I've got way more white in my hair and beard than I care for. But I'm really happy. And I want you to know why. By choosing to own my career, rather than letting it drive itself who knows where, I've made a career that gives me the things I want. I've gotten to speak at technology conferences in front of thousands of people, and I've gotten to shake the hands of people who've told me I helped them advance their own careers just a little bit. I've made some amazing friends from all around the world, and I've been blown away by their basic kindness and willingness to help. When we first wanted to buy the equipment needed to record Summit's breakout sessions, we launched a Kickstarter, and the community raised more than $30,000 in four days. Being a part of that is amazing. I've gotten to stand on stage with some of the titans of our industry, people like Mark Manassi, Mark Racinovich, and of course, Jeffrey Snover. I've become friends and colleagues with some of the most amazing people in the world, including the incredible scrappy team of Almost Rebels who made PowerShell a real thing and then trusted me with their stories when I wanted to write a book about those stories. I've gotten to reach people and they've been kind enough to let me know when it's made a positive impact on their lives. I've been in scenes like this one. Yeah, that's me up there on the stage. Little old me in front of all those people. Meeting everyone, having drinks with them, talking shop. That's been a highlight of my life, not just my career. And I'm not saying all of that to brag. I'm saying it because I only had all of those things because I sat down and decided to. I decided that was what I wanted. And in making that decision, I started down the path of making it happen. I created a vision together with my family, and we focused on that vision and our role in bringing it to life. You can do it too. 
Don't let anyone tell you what you can do and don't let anyone put boundaries on you. This is a couple I once knew. Uh, An enlisted Navy man and his young wife both graduated from high school but never went to college. They weren't wealthy. uh, And in fact, sometimes they struggled just to call themselves middle class. But they never set boundaries on that little baby. Even when his guidance counselors told him that he couldn't do computers because he didn't like his math homework, they never questioned his choices. That kid never went to college either. And like most of us, he spent a long time just bouncing through life, trying this job, trying that job, taking opportunities as they came. It took another kid, uh, this one did go to college actually, to point out that you could make decisions about your career and your life, that you could set a vision for yourself and make decisions that would help lead to that vision becoming reality. It worked out pretty well. If I had to boil it down to a bullet list, I'd offer these. Be a leader. This doesn't mean you have to be in charge. Leaders pop up everywhere in life, not just at the top of an org chart. Set a vision. Communicate your vision. Move with purpose and help others understand how they can help you achieve the vision. Don't be an island. Find your community and dive in. The more you help others, the more you will find others helping you. Our entire world would be a better place if we left our differences at home and just went outside to help each other. Own your life. Don't be a passenger in life. Be a driver. Don't just let things happen to you. Make them happen for you. I promise you can do it. If we were at a live summit right now, I'd tell you to look around the room because this is your community. And I I know you can't do that right now, but I want you to imagine it because it's real. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was at least a little fun, if not actually actionable. Uh, Please keep in touch. You can reach me on my website or Twitter or on LinkedIn. And if you'd like to see another side of my work, I've recently been writing some well-received fantasy and science fiction novels that might be worth your consideration. And now, for the moment, you've all been waiting for. These URLs are only good through the 15th of May, 2021. You're welcome to share them. You've got $5 off the minimum price for the Shell of an Idea ebook, which means the minimum price is just 20 bucks, but you can still pay whatever you think I'm worth. And for those who'd really love to show their support, you can get a limited edition hardcover. Again, all of this goes offline on the 15th of May, 2021, so don't procrastinate. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, I'm Don Jones.